not just the greatest act of corporate espionage, it's the greatest act of corporate espionage ever. Uh, and in part, it is because it was the first. So let's talk about our terms. When you're talking about industrial espionage, what are you talking about? Something is valuable. Stealing something that doesn't mean anything to anybody, it's not really stealing. It has to have a unique formula or recipe, which T has, and we're going to go into that. But if it's something that everybody can do, you're not stealing anything again. And then it also has to be protected, because if it's just in the common, you know, in the commons even, anybody can have it. So what we're looking for is, is we're starting to drill down on what a secret is. And the next thing is, it gives whoever has it a competitive advantage. It's worth something. If your competitors don't have it and you do, you're beating them. And you're the only one who has this. So let's start with valuable. Why is tea valuable? Is tea valuable? Well, by the, the uh, 16th century, tea makes its way from China and the East to Europe. And it starts uh, amongst royalty. It is in the dowry of Catherine de Barganza in the 1600s. And it works its way down social classes until everybody in Britain is drinking it. And by the 19th century, mid 19th century, it is so essential to British tastes and to the British table that the economy basically doesn't even run without tea. It is 5% of the entire economy has to do with tea by, and that's not just sales of tea, of loose tea, but it is the ships and it is the p personnel who go out to the Orient and also the tax revenues, just tea coming in, the import revenues that funds Great Britain, which in turn is funding an empire. So an entire nation is basically running on a tea economy. And similarly, China. It is almost 100% of the exports from China. China is a different case than Britain because China is self-sufficient. There isn't anything Britain has to sell that China wants. But Britain has fallen in love with tea. Britain has fallen in love with silk. The world falls in love with silk as a luxury item. And so 100% of the exports from China are of these luxury items. China has a total monopoly, a near total monopoly on tea. And this is troublesome to Great Britain. It's troublesome because you would like to have some kind of exchange. You would like to say, hey, I make woolens in Manchester, and don't you want to buy them, China? And China says, no, we have silk, thank you. And so you have to pay in silver. And this creates a tremendous trade imbalance. Um, let's talk a little bit about the unique formula. So this is the tea plant, and uh, it is a camellia. It is a uh, camellia sinensis, is its Latin name, uh, the Chinese camellia. In the mid-19th century, people thought there were two different teas. There is green tea and there is black tea. Turns out that's not true. But because they didn't know the secret formula, they had no way of knowing this. Uh, tea is propagated by seeds, but like most cultivars, you can also uh, use clones. You can transplant a clone and it'll drop roots and that will also uh, you reproduce. So you have a, an exact genetic rep reproduction. Gardeners are all into this. Um, and from the plant that we just saw, you get every color of tea there is, you, from the palest of greens to the sort of darkest of blacks. Britain, a nation addicted to tea, has no idea how this happens. So they want to change that. And they have a mission. We're at the Spy Museum. The mission, should someone choose to accept it, is step one, get tea. Step three, profit. Step two was a total mystery. <laughs> no one knew what step two was. I mean, there was, there was export from China. 
Uh, up until the First Opium War, there was one port, the Port of Canton, at the mouth of the Pearl River, and that is where all trade between China and the West and China and its neighbors happens. No one is allowed out of the city. Most of the people who are the Westerners who are working there, who are trading there, and this is a trade that takes 200 years, have never been outside their factories. They don't even get to see the city walls that are 200 yards beyond the factory. These walls are 25 feet high and 25 feet wide, and Westerners have never seen them. They are basically locked in. So the idea that like tea is this process, not just a plant, is a mystery to them. It is a total black box. As I've said, there are these two sides. Um, and just to give you a little bit of uh, background, this is China. Let's see if I can get the point on this. Um, right, so most of the tea growing areas are on the coast and a little bit inland. And you travel there mostly by water or over land. Uh, there isn't really like a horse and cart economy. You, you go over foot uh, or you hire coolies and they take you up by a sedan chair. And it's slow. Uh, this is the empire of Great Britain in the mid 19th century. And it is even slower. Uh, right up, forgive me. Um, so right here uh, in Europe, somewhere, is uh, Great Britain. And then everything that is pink are their colonies. One third of the world is pink. This tiny island off the nation, uh, off the continent of Europe, has managed, because of varying uh, geographic advantages, to become the leading war power on the planet. They uh, had favorable winds, uh, and it is a nation that is uh, great uh, sail power, and they also had mines with uh, a lot of readily available metals, so you could build your ships. And with that, they basically commanded an empire. Uh, the empire had two critical parts to it. Uh, it. Though it looks as if we are, oh, forgive me. Um, it looks like it's everywhere, and it is everywhere. But if you notice, the Africa colonies mostly hug the coasts, and that is because there was no Suez Canal in the 19th century. The only way to get to the Far East is to go all the way down and back up. You go through several summers, you go through several winters, and it is a trip that takes three months or more, and often enough you will die. Someone will die. It is very, very dangerous. Um, so the pink bits on the coast of, Europe, of uh, Africa are, they become coaling stops, but they are stops on the route to the, the gold. And the gold is India, right there, and the tiny little port of Canton, right there, which is where you do all your trade with China, which is where you get your tea, which is what makes the economy move. So tea was protected. How do we know it was protected? Because no one had ever seen it. China was so isolated that from the days of Marco Polo to the mid-19th century, not a soul had gotten in, basically. Right? From noodles coming to the court of the Medici to Queen Victoria, it was just a land that said, here be dragons. They didn't know what it looked like. In the mid-19th century, there are opium wars. And this first opium war uh, humiliated China. Britain has, is starting to have steamships. Um, Britain has gunboats. And China has junks. They have little sailing boats. And though they were extraordinary early sailors, the technology didn't really go anywhere. They weren't a colonial world war power. They didn't want colonies. And they humiliate China. I mean, in China to this day is still mad at it. <laughs> um, they were forced to sign treaties at the point of a gun, and the treaty said it's not going to be just one treaty port anymore. We're getting four more cities. And Westerners will now have four more cities in which to trade. They will have access to more of our market. Uh, same rules apply. You're not allowed to leave these treaty ports, but there were four more. Britain is licking its chops. It's fairly certain this is going to 
be a windfall for the Far East trade, and the Far East trade is critical to the na nation's economy. It is also illegal for the Chinese to leave. So all China, all Chinamen, it's a funny thing to say, but all, all Chinese were property of the emperor. Uh, he controlled the entire population. The, it was the Manchurian court. They were foreigners from the north. And they, um, <clears throat> pardon me, in order to sort of homogenize China, there's no single language right now in China. There is a collection of all kinds of different regional dialects. And there is a lot of regionalism. There's not a ton of travel. And because there's no contact with the outside world, there's almost no sense of difference. So what the uh, Manchurian court does is they order everybody to uh, have the tonsure. You shave off the front of your head and you grow a, grow a ponytail down your back, and that kind of unifies everybody visually. They are ruled by mandarins, and the mandarins, as many of you know, they uh, take exams and they become government leaders, and the emperor is at the heart of all of this. Because he possesses all Chinese citizens, uh, you are stealing from him if the Chinese leave. So we now have the case that this is really actually a trade secret that we're talking about here. But is it property? And that is a much harder case to make. In the 19th century, there was no notion that a botanical pro uh, product could really be anybody's property. You got it from God. Right? Everything on this earth came from our maker. This is prior to the publication of uh, On the Origin of the Species. And it is for mankind. This is a, still in, a, in the flourishing moments of the Enlightenment. It is for mankind to decode and dissect and understand everything on earth. Uh, because human intellect is a power that we can use to understand all these things and, by extension, understand God. But it is all from God, and so therefore nobody can own tea. And as an example, they would say, well, what about the potato? Can you own the potato? The potato comes from Peru. We have evidence that it is five to 7,000 years old. The first archaeological evidence of a potato is 2,500 years old from Peru. It is taken by the Portuguese to Europe, propagated throughout Europe. So now, do the Portuguese own it or the Peruvians? It go, spreads everywhere. It's a great little tuber. It's full of calories. It's pretty easy to grow. Trouble with ownership, too, is uh, there's liability. So to the Portuguese, are they responsible for the potato famine? Can the Irish sue the Portuguese? So all of these things are entailed on ownership. This would kind of suggest that tea is something that can't be owned, at least in the minds of the 19th century people who were trying to steal it. On top of that, intellectual property is an idea that's only starting to come into force. The first time it's written about that we have evidence of is a Massachusetts court case in 1848. And it says, basically, the judge says, we need to start protecting the fruits of the mind. We need to protect it as much as if it was somebody's sheep, as much as if it were wheat, as much of it as if it were the potato. And out of that, you get laws and a legal system that will ultimately protect intellectual property in the way we have it today. But it only started in the middle of the 19th century. And it, I think, is part of an extension of that Enlightenment notion that we can decode things, and we can understand, and we can create, and that there, there's a power in the human mind. So one way to look at this is we have two extremely powerful drug cartels. <laughs> On the left, our drug lord is Queen Victoria. She, uh, Empress of India, she is the one, when we say one third of the world was pink, that world was hers. Everyone on that pink dominion is her subject. And she, not only does she love tea, not only do her people love tea, she sells a drug. On the right, we have uh, the emperor of China. He uh, sells tea. So the drug that Queen Victoria sells is not tea. There is, as I said, this balance of payments problem. And 
for the first sort of 150, 200 years of the tea trade, Britain is bringing silver to China and bringing out tea. Over 200 years, this becomes a tremendous problem. Silver piles up in China, tea gets consumed in Britain, and the exchequer is saying, like, can we do anything to solve this? And they can. The other drug that is in this drug exchange is uh, Papaver somniferum, the opium poppy. So two flowers. This flower uh, grows in India, which is one of the jewels of Queen Victoria's imperial crown. And the way you get opium is you see this, uh, you cut open this sack, and out of it bleeds a kind of sap, which is collected and it's refined and it's milled down. And in that, there are these alkalides, morphine among them, codeine among them, that get you high, that work on the human pleasure centers. And Queen Victoria, like a good drug peddler, floods China with free samples. Uh, if you know the Tom Lehrer song, that uh, he gives free samples because he knows full well that today's young innocent faces are tomorrow's clientele. Opium is highly addictive. Um, basically, Queen Victoria and the Empire create a nation of addicts. And once they've had their free samples, and once they can no longer survive without it, now you have a fair trade. Tea for opium. You can grow opium in the northern climates of India. Tea is grown in China. And everything's fine for Queen Victoria. It is not fine for the emperor of China. He is unhappy with this trade. It turns people into addicts. They overdose. They die. His population stops working very hard. The economy falters. And it's an extreme public health problem. They are also monopolies. And what's interesting now is we read about this all the time. Monopolies choke off free trade. They uh, inflate prices artificially, and they stifle innovation. And there's plenty of innovating that people would like to do. The emperor of India is saying, well, if I'm going to have a nation of addicts, what if I just grow opium myself? Like, why must I get it from Britain, whom I hate, who humiliated me, who we just fought a war with? And Britain, similarly, is saying the price on tea, I mean, we know they pick it for a penny, right? We're selling it for three pounds. We hate that artificial inflation. We would like to get a piece of that, and we would like to have a more free market. So we can now see that there is a competitive advantage involved in possessing tea, the secrets of tea. And there is also a corporation. If we're going to have corporate espionage, it's not really enough to have two nation states. It's good to have a corporation. The East India Company is the first of its kind. It is a joint stock company, which means that uh, the owners are many people. Their shares are traded. And not only that, it's sort of the first in which most of the time, up until about the 1600s when the East India Company is chartered, owners were also the same people who managed a business. They also worked on that business. Now, there's a total separation between ownership and management. The East India Company uh, sells its stock. Their ownership is the bourgeois middle class and upper class of Britain. And the managerial class become a, uh, a kind of upwardly mobile system by which British uh, class is now a little more traversable. They produce some of the finest minds in Britain, including uh, Adam Smith and Charles Lamb. A man named Elihu Yale started a university. He was an East India Company governor. And they are the ones who control trade with the Far East. They, uh, it's, Britain has outsourced its trade to this corporation. So it's not the queen, and it's not the governors, not the Houses of Parliament who are controlling the trade with the East. It is the governors of the East India Company. Um, so, and it has a global 
reach. It really does. That Every pink bit, nearly all of it early on was originally founded by the East India Company. Over time, however, the disaffection with monopolies cuts into the East India Company's trade. Uh, they Parliament says there are all these other shipping companies that want a piece of the China trade, and it's so valuable. They cut off their monopoly with China. Now you're going to have to compete with other firms. They are lighter, they are younger, their ships are newer, and they can get back to Britain faster, and they're lowering prices. It's better for everybody when prices get lower, so that's frustrating to the East India Company. But what they still have, the one monopoly they are allowed to keep, is that they are the government of India. They run the court system, they run the civil service, they have run the Indian army. It is a private company of mercenaries, effectively, who have united an entire subcontinent of about 300 million people under the leadership of a corporation. We, um, it's not just that we can, don't have anything like this. We, it, it is almost naturally offensive to us today. Like when we have this idea of mercenaries going into other countries instead of our own army, it, it's frustrating. We don't want profit off of the state in that way. But in the time, it was extremely profitable and it was the only way the East India Company could make money anymore is that they controlled India. But they were failing at it. <laughs> India is expensive to run. Um, it is hard to pay an army. It is hard to keep a civil service going. In general, the colonial project wasn't as profitable as Great Britain would have liked it to be. But if you look at the balance sheets, colonies are expensive, and they don't pay back very well. The hope was that they had all these riches, these natural riches. They had minerals, they had metals, and they had botanical products. And out of those, in international trade, somehow the colonies would pay their way. But there are wars and there's pestilence. It's expensive. India was failing the East India Company. But tea makes the world go round. Tea is still basically the currency. And here we have India. It was a collection of princely states warring with each other. And then the East India Company comes in and they unite it all under one central government and they create one language that everybody's supposed to speak, and they put in railroads, and they create a civil servants. And the, according to Great Britain, it is the great civilizing project of India. It is a pretty insulting point of view from the Indians. We, we're plenty civilized without you, thank you, tends to be their response. But this nevertheless is the jewel that the East India Company is controlling. Um, Ah, right, so I've already covered this, forgive me, but colonies have to pay their way is very, very key. Um, so we have this kind of triangle trade between nations. We have tea in China, we have opium in India, and we have the East India Company, which controls the banking and the decision-making from London. In the middle of the 19th century, they hire a spy. And he meets all of the qualifications of the spy. His name is Robert Fortune, and he is a plant hunter. He is Scottish. He, uh, he does not have a medical degree. But the Scots, a little bit like in Star Trek, like the Scots uh, have a reputation in Britain of being like the greatest engineers, the smart ones. And so he rises through the ranks of professional botany to apprenticing himself to become really one of the finest botanists, one of maybe the five finest botanists in Britain. And it is a very noble group. It includes Charles Darwin. They are contemporaries. And plant hunters are very much the R&D men of the empire. Because colonies are expensive, if you can keep finding new things there, diamonds, gold, tea, you can make money, but you have to find them. And plant life is one of the uh, new and exciting frontiers. So they send botanists on every merchant ship around the world. We have Darwin on the Beagle, and we have Robert Fortune. He is hired uh, by, right after the First Opium War to go to China by the Royal Geographic Society, and he is hired to bring 
back plants. He's hired, he's hired to bring back peaches that are the size of basketballs and roses that climb 50 feet in the air. Nobody really knows what's in China, so his shopping list is a bit fantastical. And he's to bring them back, and they are going to these wonderful examples of science and empire. And he makes his first trip on behalf of the RGS, and it's a success, and it does well for him. He gets a better job. He becomes the man in charge of the Chelsea Physic Garden, which is a lovely, perfect little postage stamp of a garden in the middle of London. If you spend any time in London, I can't encourage you enough to go see this garden. It's really, really lovely, and it was his, and it was his at a very important time. And so one day he's in the garden, he gets a meeting from the chief botanist of the East India Company who says, we have a job for you. We have a mission. We want tea. And we don't know really what is involved. We're not sure how you're going to get from A to B, but we want it. We want it for India. We have every reason to believe that tea is going to grow just as well in India as it does in China. And it's not a dumb idea. It's not just something that came out of the top of their head. Tea grows best on hillsides. Uh, China is literally just right over the Himalayas from China. And it came about in sort of the same evolutionary moment. It has the same temperate zones. It has the same kind of rainfall. You will be able to find good analogs. Plus, they had found about 10 years previously native tea in Assam province. And the native tea in Assam province, they were so excited. It was wild. They hadn't seen tea growing before. And it was theirs. And so they packed it up and they shipped it off to Britain and the tea tasters tasted it and they said, yuck, it's not very yummy. Like, it's not good. We still prefer the China stuff. So the hope was if there is native Indian stock, then it's possible. If the Himalayas will grow tea, it's possible. We need a scientist. We need an expert. We need somebody to make this possible. We need our Steve Jobs and our Bill Gates to go make this work to sit in their garage, but their garage is going to be the forests and deserts of the planet. So Robert Fortune is engaged. He's engaged for quite a bit of money. And we need to then, because we are at the spy museum, ask, um, was he a spy? Well, according to uh, the internet, which is where all knowledge resides, um, he it spies somebody who secretly collects and reports information on the activities, movements, and plans of an enemy of competitor. So by our standards so far, as a known, he is absolutely a spy. And as a verb, is he going to be spying? He's going to be working for a government or another organization, a corporation, going in secret to collect information about his enemies and his competitors, the Chinese. So yes. By all definitions, in any time, Robert Fortune is going as a spy. Though he is not certain tea is something you can own, like the potato, he meets all of these qualifications. What is next? Ah, he goes undercover. He works for one side against another, and he knows just how much tea is worth. He knows what it means to Great Britain, he knows what it means to the East India Company. And he was paid, he was paid quite generously. For a man who had no education, he is earning a very solid middle-class salary. Also, he is given a space on East India Company ships so he can collect for himself. And it's not just that they're looking for economically useful plants, they are also looking for beautiful plants. Britain at this moment in time is at the very nascent start of the Industrial Revolution. People are moving off the land and into cities, and you are getting industries growing up. You are getting machinery. You are getting day work. You are also hitting a kind of Malthusian problem in Britain, and that is the population grows quite fast, and they can no longer feed themselves. So um, they kind of fetishize plant life at this moment. There becomes this sort of Victorian obsession with ferns and 
beautiful orchids because it's a way of symbolizing the empire and the empire stands for opportunity and under the gavel at auction you can come back with certain plants pretty plants ornamentals and they will make a lot of money so the east india company gives him space on east india company ships to bring his own personal finds home unlike when he was traveling for the RGS, for the Royal Geographic Society, where he, everything he owned belonged to the society. Now he can collect for himself, and he is a very ambitious man, and he also has a very good eye. He's a very good gardener. Um, so he goes undercover, and this is one of the reasons I wanted to write this book. He goes dressed as a Mandarin. He shaves the front of his head. He has somebody else's ponytail, sign, like, sewn into his hair and he travels through China. He doesn't speak a word of Chinese and nobody finds out because nobody knows what a Westerner looks like. <laughs> he hires uh, some guides and they do the talking for him and that would make a lot of sense. Again, there's no national language so it would be completely natural for somebody going to a region they don't know to not speak that language. Uh, he goes by ship. He goes on these junks. Uh, there's a lot of piracy. There's a lot of lawlessness. The emperor was not like a benign uh, leader. There was a lot of strife and uh, so he fights pirates. That was another reason I wanted to write this book because I thought, oh my god, he's in drag and he fought pirates. <laughs> And drag is not quite the right word for it. I think cultural transvestitism is what I call it, but it still pleased me as an author. And he went into the very darkest, furthest reaches, in places where that really had not been seen since Marco Polo. Um, he went to the richest tea grounds that China had. And he found the secret. What we are really talking about here is something so valuable, it is the equivalent of stealing the formula for Coke. And one man did it, and he did it by going undercover in China, threat of his life. So if you go beyond these treaty ports, the emperor has ordered your death. But he is bringing out one of the I mean, he's bringing out actually the most popular drink in the world next to water. So he goes to the hills and he stays uh, with many people. He stays with a domestic family. He also stays with a monastery. And over the course of his trips, he learns that tea really isn't a pick and eat fruit. It is a highly processed commodity. He also learns uh, that green tea and black tea are not different plants at all. It is a different process. It, think of it a little bit like the difference between a boiled potato and a roast potato. Black tea is your roast potato and green tea is your boiled potato. But before Robert Fortune got there, nobody knew. And not only that, he finds a number of things that uh, the green tea that is being sold in the West is being dyed green, it is being dyed with Prussian blue, and is being dyed with gypsum. The Chinese don't know why. They just say, well, you people seem to like it green. And the dyes they're using are poison. <laughs> <laughs> so Robert Fortune, in his corporate espionage, also brings this information back to the West. And it changes tea drinking, and it will genuinely change the tastes of the world after that. So when I say it's a formula, uh, there's nothing in this that you need to really study in order to like understand how tea is made. Or, but this is how you get all those shades of tea that I showed you in those teacups. These are the stages at which tea, it, the choices you make while processing, will make a different result. He finds this. So he is absolutely actively decoding. Once he has figured out how tea is made, how tea works, it's not enough. He has to bring tea out of China. And this is a problem. It is a problem for the entire empire. Plants don't like to move. I mean, they move fine across town. You can move them within a day. You can move them a little bit within a week. 
But season to season, plants, they're frustrating. They don't like it. They want a home. They want to put down roots. And T in particular was a very bad traveler. Even if they could hire someone back in the days when they were locked in the treaty ports to steal tea seeds for them, there was no way to get the tea seeds out of China and into India alive. They would all rot along the way. But technology is changing in the 19th century. This is one of the most important technological advances of the 19th century. It is a box. It is a box of glass. There is a man named Dr. Nathaniel Bagshaw Ward, who is the son of a doctor, and he discovers. He is he's a naturalist, like so many Britons, that people who love to be outdoors, and they love to take samples, and they love to study things and count them. And he has a glass bottle with a piece of mold on it, and it's on a shelf, and it's labeled. And uh, after a year or two, he looks at it, and something is growing inside. The mold hasn't died, and a seed has sprouted and is growing. And the bottle has completely been sealed the entire time. Why? He's not sure. But he now does a lot of experiments, lots and lots of bottles. At the very same time, time this is happening, tea ta uh, glass taxes in Britain are lowering. Again, you have a kind of like new uh, ethos of free trade and taxes interfere with free trade. And so the glaciers of Britain are starting to find that they have competition and the tea, it is now possible to get cheaper glass. Ward discovers in the course of his experiments that the mold in the bottle with the seed on it, this total accident, the reason it grows is because um, that basically it'll grow forever almost. It is the sunlight comes in during the day and the uh, plant aspirates carbon dioxide at night. It breathes out oxygen. The temperature changes. It condenses on the glass and drips down to the soil and repeats itself the next day. And it becomes what we now know as a terrarium. So you can keep plants alive in sealed glass boxes, and you can now afford glass. With this, the biggest problem of moving plant life around the planet is solved. And Robert Fortune is our man to solve it. He has, there's no good way to put this in the presentation. It is, but it is a, a number of very exciting chapters. Uh, <laughs> he, ha he has a lot of failures. His first year of plant hunting, he has bags and bags, really thousands of little seedlings and shrubs and seeds. And he ships them all to India, and 100% of them are dead when they get there. He goes back to the drawing board. He experiments again. Over time, he is successful. So what does it mean? What does it mean to have tea gardens in India? Well, tea takes six years to reach maturity. By about year seven, they find that the tea coming out of India is excellent. It's really, really good. He also has brought out tea makers and tea equipment. He has violated the emperor's edicts and shipped Chinese tea makers to the Himalayas, and they have taught their secret to Indian tea makers. Not only is the tea in the Himalayas good, it's like really good. Darjeeling, you will always hear the phrase, it is the champagne of tea. They create teas that are more valuable than the tea out of China. And within a generation, tea in India is starting to really make money. And China doesn't catch up again until like yesterday. It takes almost 150 years before the Chinese market can stand up to India's. And that's only because China got rich. By, in terms of exports, India leads for the next 150 years. So industrial espionage works. There's a lot at stake. Um, despite all these successes, the company does not make it. Um, governing is difficult. Governing from London is even harder. And the 
people of India have never been super happy under the colonial thumb. Uh, shortly after Robert Fortune gives the company the gift of tea that will save its fortunes, the East India Company introduces a new rifle, the P-53. And uh, prior to that, they were still using the same flintlock uh, rifle that they had used in the Napoleonic Wars almost 50 years before. But technology changes. Uh, they find rifling barrels works, and they have new ways of priming gunpowder, and they've, there's a new shape to a bullet. You don't need it to be around. You can actually point the end, and it spins better like a football. And so the uh, East India Company introduces a new rifle. And uh, the way you load this rifle is you have a packet of gunpowder, and you open it with your teeth, and you pack the gunpowder in, and, you, and then you put the bullet on top of it. Um, required a bit of grease. The grease that was used was a mix of uh, beef tallow and pig fat. So if you know anything about India, uh, Pigs are forbidden to Muslims, and beef is forbidden to Hindus. It is genuinely almost as if they could not have picked a more offensive <laughs> grease to send to the entire India army. And rumors spread that uh, it is the way that the East India Company is trying to convert all of India into Christianity. So. In the summer of 1857, India erupts. There is death by the thousands, really by the millions. There's just, it is among the great sort of human catastrophes brought on by colonialism. It happens because of a gun. And the East India Company loses its charter. It, had, it was called the greatest assortment of uh, governors in the universe. And then it is gone in a heartbeat. And Queen Victoria takes over, she's the Empress of India, and at least for the next 50 years or so, India is the jewel in the crown. Ah, tea contributes very much to India, not just economically, but it spurs on industrialization. So there are a lot of sort of knock-on effects of espionage that we don't think, they're unintended consequences. It's not just, for instance, that Robert Fortune in the act of espionage is revolutionizing the Wardian case technology, but uh, because tea requires boiled water, in a moment that Britain is industrializing, you start to have a population boiling their water. You have an overseas empire that is bringing in all kinds of virulence, including cholera, and people are boiling their water. It helps. It keeps people alive. It lowers the infant mortality rate. And not only that, tea is an excellent venue. Uh, it's a vehicle by which you can get calories into yourself. So tea itself is non-caloric. Plants in water, the steepage is just flavored water. But you put milk in it. It's a source of protein. And you put sugar in it and it is a very dense source of calories. And as I mentioned, Britain has this Malthusian crisis at this, this very same moment. There's no longer a way to produce enough food to feed the entire island nation. On top of that, there is another way you could say, uh, get calories into your workforce via liquid, and that is with beer. Alcohol also kills parasites. Unfortunately, it makes you a bit of a liability if you are working with heavy machinery. On top of that, you now also start to out-eat your wheat and your hops. It happens all very quickly. Tea is the solution to a lot of problems. On top of that, though Britain has already lost its American colonies and they are gone forever, they still have a few Caribbean colonies that are sugar colonies that are producing excess sugar. And colonies, as we know, tend to be drains on the national bank account. So you can take sugar from your vestigial sugar colonies, put it in your tea that you are now getting from your British colony, and you can feed a workforce with sanitized water. And it spurs industrialization. Britain industrializes 50 years before alcoholic cultures, such as uh, Germany and such as France. And it is entirely because of tea. 
So Robert Fortune is the father of many things. He, he was a great spy. He is a spy who changed the course of nations. Um, he also dies a very rich man, which I think is a nice bit, uh, a coda for him. Because he was able to ship things on East India Company boats, he brings home jades, he brings home sculptures, and he brings home many, many plants, plants that we know. And he changes our gardens, and he sells them, and when he dies, his estate is valued at something like $5 million today. For a man who had no education, who was really restricted from the upper classes of his own profession because he didn't have a medical degree, because he didn't go to university, because it was, you were required to pay for your university, he dies solidly upper class. He gives the rest of his, every generation going forward, a leg up they would not otherwise have had. Um, and the plants, just for people who are gardeners, they are ones you know. It is, uh, for instance, the kumquat. Citrus fortunilla. That was one of his. Uh, the lilac daphne, the bleeding heart. If people are gardeners, this is wonderful uh, annual. The bleeding heart is genuinely beautiful. All of these came out of China. China, because it covers such wide ground, is a hothouse for evolution. It has one of the great uh, zones for biodiversity. And so many of our garden plants come from China. It is even said that there were no red roses in England prior to the advent of plants from the East, that all the roses were just pink, pale white, pale pink. It took to get a deep, deep rose it required crossbreeding from the East. So Robert Fortune was a successful spy on many fronts. And on top of all that, he cracked the formula for Coca-Cola. So that is my presentation on the greatest act of corporate espionage in history. And we have 15, 20 minutes for uh, questions, if anybody would like to. We've got a microphone if anybody has any questions. So we can meet, we've got one right here. Thank you, very good, thank you. Um, what about poor tea? Sure, well I have an expert here who is far better at speaking to what poor tea is uh, than I am. So I like to say that I am the historian, not the chef. We have a chef in the back. And she right now is preparing a cup of tea for you, but I think that if we hand her the microphone, she will do a far better job of letting you know what it is than I am. It is an aged pressed tea, is about as far as I can get. I didn't hear the question. She's asking, what is pu'er tea? It's a, a specialty tea that, take it away. It's a big question. Um, so yes, it's a pressed tea. Uh, traditionally, they press it into bricks so that it could make the journey um, over the Silk Road or the, the Tea Horse Road, a lot of times it's called. Um, there's two ways of making it. There's a, a, a shoe and a show, and it's a really complicated process. I'm happy to talk to you about it further if you would like, because it, it really is um, one of the wonderful teas of China. If you've ever tried it, it's filled with um, probiotics, which work to um, lower cholesterol in your system, it's actually um, written about. So it's not just mumbo jumbo health stuff. It really does work in your system. They drink it a lot in China after a heavy meal to cut the fat from a meal. Um, that's like, you know, duck and oil and those kinds of things. Um, it has a very earthy taste. There are many different types. There's also dark tea, which is a category. Um, it, at one point in time, was traded like gold on the stock market in the East. That kind of crashed after a few years, but people age tea for many, 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 many years. There's some that go back you know, 40 and 50 years. Um, I don't know if I've answered all your question. I can go on and be an awful tea nerd about it, but that's basically um, a little bit about a puer or sure. poor. Okay. 
Next up. Okay. Uh, can you talk about your sources? Sure, absolutely. So my primary source was Robert Fortune himself. For, uh, for all of our benefits, he wrote three books about his trip to the East. They are memoirs. They are boring. They are boring as the day is long. I have saved you all by giving you the good parts version. Uh, there is an awful lot about the plant depths and all the plants that he finds. There, it's a gardener's catalog, and it is occasionally punctuated by moments where he fights pirates or he uh, is chased by bandits. But mostly, it, he wrote three very dull Victorian travel logs. Uh, and out of those three, that was my primary source. Uh, secondary, my next kind of best source was the British Library, where it, which has the remains of the East India Company documents. By and large, when the East India Company lost its charter, they threw out the papers. They, nobody, it didn't occur to them people would be interested. The British Library managed to save quite a few, and it is very exciting. It's just very cool to be there. The reading room is gorgeous. The East India Company librarian seems to just know everything under the earth, and you really do have this sense of, I am reading this for the very first time in 200 years. I'm the only person right now alive who knows this information. So many very happy days in the British Library as well. I also had lived in Hong Kong, so I had an advantage. My very first job out of, Hong of college, I had moved to Hong Kong, and it was during the Hong Kong handover. And so I was right in the thick of the story that gave Hong Kong its identity, which is to say it was this tiny little British outpost that was won in the Opium Wars, and it was being given back because the island of Hong Kong belonged to Britain forever, but the territory on the mainland did not. And a four-mile island is not very useful if you don't, can't get anywhere from it. So I was there when it went back to China in 1997. And the stories of colonial Britain and imperial China were very much on the tip of everybody's tongue. It was what we were studying at the time. So that was my kind of deeper background. And then out of that, uh, the University of Chicago Library I don't live in Chicago, but the University of Chicago Library is the world's greatest. Uh, next, well, you're here. You have the Library of Congress. Second to the Library of Congress, the University of Chicago Library. Harvard has more books, but they are closed stacks. The University of Chicago, all open stack, and it is a joy. So the rest of my research was done there. And then I traveled. I had a really wonderful uh, translator. He was a former Chinese diplomat, and in China, Everybody has to retire at 50 because there are just too many Chinese and you have to have people come up behind you. So he was forcibly retired at 50. He had lived through Tiananmen. He was a member of uh, the party. His parents had been members of the party. He had lived through all of the worst parts of China and he loved China. He was so patriotic. And despite all the advances and, and the way that the Chinese communists don't love their own history, he did. Um, he wanted to know this hidden imperial history that had been erased. So though I can't read Chinese and my, I can't speak Chinese, he could and he did. And he, um, he went and found me pretty much every relic, every little building that was left over from imperial China that hadn't seen the wrecking ball. And if there, it was within kind of like a 300 mile radius of where I was looking for the book, he got me there. So most of the places Fortune visited are now incredibly you know, tiny Chinese cities or extremely large American cities, you know, two million, three million strong, and nobody knows their name. And I couldn't get any information out of them. But 100 miles away, there was a tiny little village that still had all the old wood and hadn't been ripped down and we would go there and he took me there. So that's how I got the on the ground. Um, same in India, although in India I could travel on my own. I didn't need a translator and I had lived in India for nine months after I'd left Hong Kong so I also kind of did the same thing. I went on a tea pilgrimage and that, well, it was a joy. <laughs> um, did Robert Gordon express, you know, did he have an appreciation for the Chinese culture or his travels? I'm curious. So that's a good question. She asked, you know, how, how did he feel about them? Um, mostly he was kind of a Victorian jerk. 
uh, he was a man of his times. He thought that Western culture was superior, that the Chinese were uncivilized. He uh, was very uncomfortable. It was very difficult traveling there. Over time, he comes in his book to appreciate it. He comes to appreciate that it is a culture that reveres gardeners. He finds this point of intersection between his love and their love of gardens. And he also finds that when he is in the hills of China, it reminds him of his home growing up in Scotland. And he spends time with the monks, and they are Confucian monks. And he is very transfixed by this culture by the end. So I don't think he ever really loses his terrible colonialism, chauvinism. But he comes to appreciate elements of Chinese culture. Sure, yes. Question, curiosity about, about green tea versus uh, red or black tea. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's a general perception that the green tea is better for your health, but, but now I'm hearing your <laughs> presentation about well, the history. Most history. certainly was not better for your health when it was being poisoned. <laughs> um, so what's the status today in terms of it, well, is it any difference really? So one of the things that, the, when he found out about the poisons, he shipped them back to Britain, and they were on display in the Great Exhibition of 1853, which was uh, Victoria's husband, Albert, has this idea that you can show off all the scientific advances of the world, and people will come, and people did come. And they saw the poison, and they were like, I like this black tea better. It's not going to kill me. And black tea has this advantage that it takes milk and it takes sugar. So it solved the problem Britain had, or was starting to have, about feeding itself. So historically, black tea was healthier for you in that respect. Um, I am not, I think, the right person to sound in on the medical benefits of green versus black tea, in part because so many of the studies are garbage. Um, it, 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 there's too much, there's too many of them, they're not reproducible necessarily, and, um, and they say everything you want. They will keep you alive longer, they will lower your heart rate, they will make you sexually, you know, powerful, like, they will do everything. So, I have not spent enough time with the literature to see, to separate the wheat from the chaff, and I can certainly, again, turn to our expert who knows a lot more about tea itself than I do. Go ahead. So the specific question is, is black tea as healthy as green tea? Is that right? Um, yeah, I get that question a lot. <laughs> and um, so all tea is good for you. So you should be drinking it every day. <laughs> and it has a cumulative, a cumulative effect on the body. Um, so. There's research and science around um, green teas and some of the health benefits around that. You hear a lot about it helping with cancer. That's one of the, um, the big ones. As I said, all tea is good for you. There's like specific things that are maybe like black tea, really good for health heart. Um, there's new research on brain health related to Alzheimer's and black tea, although green tea is good as well. Um, I've been to a lot of the science here in Washington where they, they meet every year, every other year, and they talk about it also related to weight loss. And um, I always say that if you stop eating and you drink tea, you will definitely lose weight. <laughs> so there is that. Um, there's so much around the science of tea that I would just say that if you can um, if you can have tea because of the caffeine, have a little bit each day. They say, I think it's uh, two to three cups a day. Mix it up, green, black, even oolongs. Um, maybe add in some really great rooibos because there's a lot of minerals in that, so that contributes to um, really good health, especially for women, because um, there's magnesium, it helps you sleep. It can go on and on forever. You can just keep digging in this rabbit hole of information that's always, you know, new every year there's always research on it if you're someone that has caffeine sensitivity then it's not for you then that wouldn't be a good health benefit for you and you would have to stay away from it so it's like everything um, you have to sort of you know research it have some balance and moderation I have many customers that can't touch tea at all they ask me for um, decaffeinated blacks or greens which I don't carry 
um, it's either real tea or you have to have um, a tisan, which is anything else that isn't Camellia sinensis. So I hope that was helpful, because it can go on forever, honestly. <laughs> Uh, terrific research in writing. The book is a, a great story. Thank uh, you. You tell a great story. Um, the garden in London, what is, uh, what's there? The Chelsea Physic Garden. So it is uh, just off Sloan Square. It's not very far walk. Uh, it's not very easy to get to by uh, tube, only because it's a part of London that's just not served by tube. It's too rich. They don't need it. Um, but it is right on the river, and it is a... I don't know, it's maybe the size of two of these rooms. I mean, it is very, very tiny, and it was originally uh, dedicated for Materia Medica, which is plants for medical science. Most of our plants still come, and most of our medicines, sorry, still have their origin in plant life. Aspirin, uh, for instance, that they are, we are the great research lab of the world is evolution. And so there was a lot of known plants uh, and what they could do for you. They could settle a stomach, they could make pain go away. All the plants that were useful for medicine were planted in this garden. And over time, uh, organized, they were organized on the Linnaean classification system, which is to say how it sexually reproduces. And now it is kind of a museum to that time when plants were the source of all of our medicine and the way that the Lin Enlightenment scientists, the Linnaean taxonomers, were trying to organize the world. So it's a wonderful spot just because it's beautiful. It has all these great garden flowers, but it also has all this like interesting plant history. If you are if you just want a lovely walk, it's good. But if you want a wonderful romp through history and science, it's also wonderful. I can't recommend it enough. It is genuinely one of the gems, the hidden gems of London. And when you're looking at those records of the uh, East India Tea Company, how do you get out of the library with copies of what you need to look at later at home? You do not. Um, and not only that, I mean, technology has changed so fast that I didn't, you weren't even allowed to, there was no phone when I was writing this book that could take a picture of an original document. I would sit there with my laptop and type everything out. And um, the script was all very light and all like very beautiful and written by some clerk in India 200 years ago. It was a joy, but uh, there was, I don't have any pictures of what those books look like because I wasn't allowed to. Hi, so you talk about the, the industrial espionage that happened here, and it's clear that he went to great lengths to hide himself and to get out of the treaty ports. You talked a little bit about the enforcement of what would happen if you left and they found mm -hmm. you. Were there people in China who were sort of their version of an FBI who were looking for people trying to steal their intellectual property? So that's an excellent question. And um, they were a little, I would say not on the level of the FBI. But certainly, the closer he was to the coast, the more he was worried about being found out. He was more likely to run into somebody who knew what a foreigner looked like. That when he's in the interior, no one knows that he is a six foot tall Scottish guy. But the closer you are to the coast, the more you look like a sailor. And so he was very worried about that. And uh, there was a trade in bodies. So though it was illegal to take Chinese people out of China, the end of the British slave trade happens in the 1830s, and there is a need, a global need, for very cheap labor. So you start to get uh, people stolen from China, put onto ships, and shipped abroad to Australia. Some of them end up in the uh, gold rush in America because they need extremely cheap labor and bodies. Um, the word Shanghai, right? Basically, you were stolen in the middle of the night and put on a boat, and so there are certainly mobs, there are certainly kind of an underground, and then there is the official mandarins don't want you leaving. There are censuses. So yeah, there's some oversight. It's not centralized, but the problem was large enough that it was a problem. Lids 
he, you know, he is a Mandarin, and because he he dresses like a Mandarin, he has this status that he can make the peasants believe what he wants them to. They are not Mandarins. And so when he tells them that these are my boxes and I am from a distant land beyond the Great Wall, they're like, yeah, all right. <laughs> we can't challenge that. We don't have an outside source of information at that moment. So, so, was, uh, so did tea time emerge because people were like crashing in the afternoon? It was, it was a sugar and caffeine high and it in part, up to I mean, I look at a sort of uh, more macroeconomic uh, cause, which is to say the Industrial Revolution, for the very first time in human history, creates leisure time. So you don't have to eat on the run. Tea time becomes a part of that. It is the very first time you might be able to get everyone together for a family that's not a, for a meal that's not a weekend after church. Um, or a holiday, and you can make it a kind of ritual. So I think tea time evolves at this moment mostly because people start to have time, because life gets better because of industrialization. They have now accumulated enough wealth that they don't have to work 12-hour days, sunrise to sunset, to meet their basic needs. You start to have a more specialized economy. So that is the, the more general answer for the uh, evolution of tea time. <laughs> All right, here we go. Thank you. A little bit out of left field. How much British love of tea might be out of stubbornness for the fact that they didn't have coffee? The second most <laughs> traded commodity in the world behind oil is coffee. Dutch East India Company had Indonesia, Sumatra, Java. And so and it's kind of left field, but they didn't have any colonies with that high elevation, 4,000 feet, to harvest coffee. So we have to suck it up and drink tea instead. How much of a, a kind of reminds me of Richard Burton. Right. I don't know which guy came first? <laughs> no, it's, it, it's very much like, um, and there was plenty of trade with the Dutch. So there was no reason that the British couldn't buy from the Dutch East India Company. Um, were there a genuine sort of native preference to coffee? They could buy it. They weren't, and, and the market is pretty mature by the time Robert Fortune goes to China. It's almost 200 years old. So I don't think it is because of a geographical underpinning that they aren't coffee drinkers. I think genuinely they preferred tea. And also, you know, the East India Company controls imports. So the East India Company has tea, and they are in control of what's getting in and out of British ports, they put a thumb on the scale, a fairly heavy thumb on the scale, too, would be my guess. But not, again, I think that because of a, any kind of geographical origins. The East India Company just could have colonized something with <laughs> coffee. They had the guns. Uh, they, Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks again to the Tea Museum for setting this up. It was an extraordinary event.